Welcome, everyone. We are going to begin the webinar on COVID-19 health and safety for collision shops. I'm Melissa Joles with RDA Impact. Brandon Thomas, president of GMG and VirusSafe, is your presenter for this webinar. The presentation will take approximately 30 minutes. We are recording it and we'll post it on our YouTube channel. If you have questions during the webinar, you can type them in the chat box at the bottom right of your screen and Brandon will answer those at the end of the presentation. Now, I'll turn it over to Brandon. Thanks, Melissa. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you and your families are all doing well and staying safe in this pandemic. Uh, thanks for taking the time out of your busy schedules on short notice to jump on this call and talk with us today. Uh, in a weird way, I am excited for the opportunity uh, to talk to you about COVID-19 and as it relates specifically to the collision repair industry. Uh, for those of you that don't know me or haven't participated in one of these webinars before, uh, I've been a part of the collision repair industry for many years now. I was the president of Collision Revision, which was a 30-shop MSO in the Midwest prior to joining GMG and Virusafe as their president. I've been working with GMG now for a little bit over nine years and will be presenting today from the perspective of a health and safety standpoint. Uh, an important disclaimer for everyone on this call, I am not a medical doctor, so I will not be able to provide any type of medical advice or guidance beyond reiterating CDC guidelines. However, we will be able to do a deep dive into how to protect your business, your employees, and your communities. GMG and VirusSafe has been servicing the collision repair industry for over 30 years, uh, specifically with EPA, OSHA, and DOT compliance helping shops set up employee health and safety programs. Uh, and we service thousands of shops all throughout the United States. Now, where I'd like to start today is first, whether or not a body shop is classified as an essential business. As COVID-19 continues to spread, we are going to see more states and counties issuing stay at home or shelter in place orders, closing non-essential businesses. And from the marketplace and in talking to some of our clients, there's been some confusion as to whether or not a collision repair facility is classified as an essential business and is allowed to operate. Uh, as a reminder, functional personal transportation is absolutely critical for all of the other essential businesses and their employees to continue operating. So whether that's doctors and nurses going to healthcare facilities, or employees that are traveling to power plants or other types of infrastructure in the country, they rely on their personal transportation to do it. So absolutely, collision repair and auto repair in general is classified as an essential business. Nearly all stay-at-home or shelter-in-place orders that we've seen throughout the country have specifically identified those classifications. But taking it one step further, the Department of Homeland Security on a federal level issued guidance on March 19th that designates auto repair as essential for the entire country. Now, that does not mean that there might not be law enforcement or a city or county inspector that reaches out to your business and says, hey, you really need to be closed. You're a non-essential business. And we've already heard from some of our clients around the country where they've gotten that feedback or been told that they're not allowed to operate. If this does happen for your business, uh, ask whomever is telling you what order they are referencing that requires you to close. It is a possibility that a local municipality or county has another order that specifically supersedes the state requirement. However, in most instances, a local municipal inspector or someone from the city is trying to enforce a state or broader county level order where you'll be classified as essential. Stay calm, just get a copy of the order. I would keep one available at your front desk so that if someone was to visit your facility or call, you could reference the language and remind them that collision repair is an essential business and allowed to stay open. Now, some shops, even though they're considered an essential business, have chosen to close their doors for a period of time. Um, obviously, with the economic downturn and whip counts being much lower, uh, some businesses are choosing to shut down for a few weeks to 30 days in an attempt to minimize the spread, uh, cut some costs, and do what is needed to survive in this economy. 
If you're on this call, I'm going to assume that you understand that you are allowed to stay open and intend on staying open. But we all have to be mindful of that while your business may be open and continue to operate, there is still increased risk of COVID-19 exposure for you and your employees. We really need to take the time to reevaluate all processes and procedures so that we can eliminate any potential exposure and further spread of this virus. Things that we've taken for granted over the years, whether it's operations in the shop or processes in the front office, need to be evaluated so that we can incorporate best practices to ensure the health and safety of not of your employees, but also your customers and your vendors. So really the question we want to answer today is, how do you keep everyone safe and do your part to eliminate the spread of this virus? Well, I think one of the things that we have to start with is how does the virus transmit from person to person? Over the last several months, as our knowledge of this virus has evolved, we've learned a lot about it. And there has been good information from the CDC right out of the gate, but with more cases and more spread, we continue to deepen our understanding of this virus and how it transmits. There was a recent um, Vimeo interview with Dr. David Price at the Cornell Medical Center a couple of days ago. This particular medical center is handling about 20% of all New York City patients with COVID-19. It's a 1,200 bed hospital and they are dedicated exclusively to COVID-19 treatment. And there were two quotes that stood out for me that I think we need to make sure we have a comfort level with. The first is the reason why people get this disease is you have sustained contact with someone, such as shaking hands, and then you touch your face. It is that simple. This is not a disease that you are most likely getting from the air. To prevent the transmission of this disease in 99% of cases is to know that your hands are clean and not touch your face, period. You do not need a medical mask. There was a lot of confusion early on based on the feedback from the CDC that this disease is transmitted from respiratory droplets. Uh, respiratory droplets coming from coughing, sneezing, talking, expelling any type of fluid, um, and then that getting onto um, someone's hands, a surface, or into their mouth or nose. Now, this is consistent with that, but there was some thought that a respiratory droplet in the air could be breathed in or that this disease is airborne, which we are not seeing. So if we are focusing on surfaces, clean hands, and not touching your face, what can we do from a customer, vendor, and employee standpoint to create a safe and healthy working environment? First, from a customer perspective, they are absolutely bombarded with information, most of it bad, from the news, their Facebook feeds, friends, family, social media. It is an absolute minute-by-minute groundswell of information about coronavirus. And because of that, they're afraid. And so the first thing we need to do when preparing a shop for a customer visit is to really demonstrate them to them that your shop is a safe place to visit. You have taken enhanced precautions to protect their well-being, and it's okay for them to visit you and conduct business. Where that starts is communication before they ever walk into your facility. If we have any scheduled estimates, drop-offs, deliveries, we need to get them on the phone in advance and explain to them that they have options available if they want to limit their contact and potential exposure. Customers could stay in their vehicles while an estimate is being written. They could leave their keys in their vehicle when they're dropping off. Uh, they could leave their keys in a drop box. However, there are a lot of facilities out there with drop boxes already. I would ask you to review your process there uh, because it could be an anxiety point for a client if it has a metal surface that they have to open to drop their keys in and they're not sure you know, if it's been sanitized or when the last time it was sanitized and how many people have touched that today. We also can transition anything that can be done by telephone or email so that they're not spending as much time at your facility or in your facility. Estimates, final paperwork, payments, those types of things can all be done by telephone or email to try to limit their exposure, their contact with your staff, which ultimately creates a more safe working environment for your employees as well as for your customers. Now, some business will just need to be conducted in person. Some clients 
although they might appreciate the different levels of options available, still would be more comfortable entering the facility and working with you in person. For those individuals that tell you that, again, we want to prep them on those telephone calls to expect enhanced precautions and different processes to protect their health and safety. You may also get just unscheduled visits from customers, someone that comes in for an estimate and you didn't know they were coming. So communication is critical to managing those expectations. If you have been to a grocery store or a hardware store or other business, you have likely seen signs posted throughout the facilities communicating how things have changed. If you've already put these up, I would ask you to revisit what messages are you sending by having them posted because I've seen some that have been a little poorly done because they try to do too much. What I mean by that is every single precaution, every single procedure is put on one piece of paper in small font that's hard to read, taped throughout the facility and on the outside of the facility. And clients, when they pull up to their, the parking lot of your shop, they can't read it from the safety of their car. They're already nervous about what they need to do. They don't know what the expectations are. And there's just a lot of information for them to try to take in. Instead, think through the information that they absolutely need to know when they're pulling into your parking lot. That is what should be on the sign. And then when they get to the lobby or the front door, what information needs to be there to tell them about the specific changes or enhanced precautions that are available. And then when I get to the front counter, the fact that some things might be different or removed, that's the type of truncated or succinct messaging that's in larger font that creates a welcoming environment and lets them feel comfortable about moving through the different phases of that transaction and then going back home or to work. Again, we're focused on surfaces, so we need to remove all high-touch shared items in your lobbies. Now, I know these are client conveniences. I know these are designed to enhance the customer experience, but in today's world, these are anxiety points. These are things that clients could be nervous about, um, that maybe multiple people have handled. Maybe they haven't been sanitized. It also could very well likely result in transmitting the virus from one of your clients or employees to another client. So we need to take the precautions to remove things like magazines, remote controls, iPads, coloring books, toys for kids, uh, as well as any food and beverages and refreshments. We don't want to have a small mini fridge with a handle that somebody's opening up repeatedly and we're not able to keep up with sanitization or multiple people come in at the same time and now they're touching surfaces and potentially touching their face. At the front counter, any shared type items, clipboards, pens, business cards, credit card machines, take all of that off the front counter, put up a sign that explains why those things have been removed and how we're going to do business moving forward. And keep their health and safety in mind as you look and reevaluate the types of items that can be removed. If you're lucky enough to have an inventory of hand sanitizer or if you made your own hand sanitizer with isopropyl alcohol or some other type of material, um, keep it on the counter. That would be one thing that would be good to have available in case that client would like to sanitize their hands before or after the transaction because they might have rested their hands on the counter or they might have actually picked something up or Maybe they just forgot and, you know, shook someone's hand or something, and that's going to make them feel a little bit more at ease. In terms of your vendors, I really group these into two categories, non-essential vendors and essential vendors. To me, the essential vendor are the absolute critical people uh, that need to do what they do to keep your business running so that you can fix vehicles. Your paint distributor, your allied supplies, parts, sublet vendors, tow trucks, to me, are all in a class of themselves known as essential vendors. Your non-essential vendors, if they haven't already incorporated policies and procedures to not visit your facility, um, I would contact them now and ask them to refrain visiting your facility for the next two to four weeks. Any meetings or things that they need to address or business that they need to conduct. If they're in the non-essential, let's do that via webinar. Let's do that via FaceTime or telephone call or Zoom meeting. Let's not increase the amount of traffic of people that are coming to your facility because they may have also been at 10 other businesses that day and you don't know what protocols they've had or what they've touched with their hands. In terms of your essential vendors, I understand 
that all shops are different throughout the United States. Some have different layouts, parking lots, and there might not be a feasible way to do this. But ideally, you would have one specific area for each individual essential vendor to drop off their materials. So paint and supplies is going in one part of the shop, parts and sublet in another, tow trucks in another. Now, if your facility cannot accommodate that just because of the floor plan, then it's okay to have one specific area for all of those vendors to visit, but tell them to stagger or to wait in their car until that vendor has finished what they're already doing. So you don't have three or four vendors standing around trying to deliver things and being next to each other or exposing your potentially your employees. When you set up those designated areas, ask the essential vendors to stay within their designated area to maintain social distancing with your employees, and they should not enter the lobby or shop areas. Now, I know paint distributors uh, are fantastic about keeping your inventory stocked and organized. They want to help. They want to go into the mix room. They want to go to the material cards. They want to organize things for you, take an order, look at what you need, and that is a wonderful service under normal circumstances. In today's world, however, those are surfaces that they're touching with their hands that now have potential exposure areas to your employees. That type of practice needs to be suspended so that they're just dealing with ideally one designated person at your facility and one designated area so that you're limiting your exposure to everybody in the facility. Now, if you have the staff that you can designate one person, an estimator, for instance, to deal with all tow trucks, a uh, production manager to deal with all parts and sublet, and maybe a parts coordinator or a paint team lead to deal with all paint and supplies, that's fantastic. Your vendors should already have started to transition away from requiring signatures on delivery um, or allowed some type of touch-free way to confirm. However, not all of them are going to have that capability. So if there is still some requirement to sign for deliveries, please just make sure whomever is the designated contact at your shop isn't sharing pens to work with you know, that particular vendor. They're using their own equipment, and when they're handling any type of clipboard or tablet, they sanitize um, their hands immediately after that transaction. In terms of your employees, um, not only in interacting with each other, but interacting with vendors and customers, physical contact needs to be suspended. Handshakes, fist bumps, high fives, hugs needs to be eliminated across the board. Everyone needs to be reminded to maintain adequate social distancing of three to six feet. Now, you've got coworkers that might be working there for a long time. Some of these individuals may be friends outside of work. They may have known each other for many years. And in the safety world, we talk about sometimes you have to get awkward and communicate that someone is doing something that is unsafe rather than allowing someone to be hurt or killed. And that translates into the COVID-19 marketplace today. We want to provide word tracking and set the expectation at the managerial level or the ownership level of your facility that it's okay to get awkward and communicate we need to maintain boundaries for social distancing, even though we may be friends or have worked together for 10, 15 years. If you can provide your staff a way to do that, it eliminates a lot of the interpretations and potential hurt feelings or antagonism as your team that is already under a tremendous amount of stress and pressure uh, to communicate effectively. One of the things that our clients started to incorporate is just a standard expression. If a coworker starts to violate personal space or get too close for social distancing or a client who doesn't know that attempts to approach, they're just reminded to say, your safety is important to all of us. Please respect the six foot rule to ensure that we limit everyone's exposure. But this way, we at least neutralize the feedback and we give the employees a way to set that boundary. Your production meetings should be suspended. Uh, we do not want to have 10 employees sitting in a break room touching paper, pen, tables, chairs, doorknobs, the coffee pot, the refrigerator, the sink, um, while we're going over whip count and production. Uh, instead, we want to be communicating on a one-on-one -on -one basis. I know that's going to take a lot more time. I know that's going to slow things down.
but it is the safest way to communicate in your shop to make sure that people aren't contracting this virus, spreading it to other employees in the shop, and then you lose half or most of your staff because they're at home sick. Also, after every customer and vendor interaction, your staff should be asked to wash their hands with soap and water. We have years and years of habits of how we communicate verbally and physically with our faces, with our hands, with our body language. It is hard to unwire that. And so we all can be trained and go over these things and try to be mindful of them, but we might make a mistake. We might touch something that they touched, or we might share a device or a pen, or we might get too close. If we just build it into the protocol, when you interact with a parts vendor or a sublet vendor or someone from the insurance company or you interact with a customer, just take the time to wash your hands to make sure that they have clean hands and also that they don't touch their face. We're going to be able to make sure they don't contract this virus at your facility. And I said it briefly, but I'm going to reemphasize this point. We also have to psychologically work to no longer touch our faces. This COVID-19 virus lives on surfaces, gets on your hands, and then you touch your mouth, nose, or eyes, and that is exactly where the virus wants to be so that it can propagate and then infect the human body and spread. So keep your hands clean, don't touch your face. In addition, we should be looking at our high-touch surfaces and having a frequent disinfecting schedule for things like door handles, light switches, keyboards, phones, um, even things like parts carts need to be disinfected frequently. Uh, when a customer drops a vehicle off, they should remove everything, not just the toll pass, not just the garage door opener, remove all personal items. That way we limit the exposure of any one of your employees coming into contact with something personal that might have the virus on the surface. Before we ever begin repairs, before we ever bring the vehicle around to start a teardown or estimating process, we should be disinfecting the keys, the key fob, the door handles, the steering wheel. Any other high touch area in the vehicle should be disinfected. Uh, when we're doing that, we want to wear latex gloves. And after we finish disinfecting, we discard those gloves by pulling from the heel of the glove inside out and throwing in the trash. There was a press release on repair driven news this morning. Uh, nationwide announced that they are now paying one hour of labor and $25 in materials to sanitize vehicles. So your estimators can put that on an estimate, maybe an opportunity for other insurers to follow suit, but this is absolutely a new cost and a requirement for your business to be able to fix vehicles. Good discussion opportunity to possibly offset some of those costs. In terms of in your shop itself, we also have to be mindful of shared equipment. These are things like welders, torch carts, lifts, frame racks, AC machines, the scale, um, mixing computers, things like that. Policy should be already enacted that employees are wearing gloves whenever they're handling shared equipment. But also, the virus can go from a um, piece of cardboard where it can live for up to 24 hours or pieces of metal or plastic where it can live up to 48 to 72 hours can get onto a glove and into a person's face or body. Gloves are not just an automatic default. You're protected. They are wonderful forms of PPE, but we still need to do a sanitization process. So any area on shared equipment that is being touched should be sanitized before and after use. If I'm using a two post lift and I'm gonna move the arms and the control modules, I should be sanitizing that before and after I use it and wearing gloves. That way I know that I'm not at risk and I'm not putting any other my coworkers at risk. I really see it similar to when you go to the gym. If you're using a leg press uh, or a bench press, before you ever sit on it, you wipe it down, and after you're done, you wipe it off. That way, the next person benefits, you benefit, and we eliminate the potential transmission of the virus. From a PPE standpoint, respirators should be stored in individual containers when they're not being used. That means a sealed bag or a sealed Tupperware container, and each technician and painter should have their own. 
We should not see respirators laying out in the mix room, laying on tool, back, tool boxes, laying on benches to where they're potentially being exposed. Employees should not be sharing respirators, safety glasses, that type of equipment where it's going to be on one person's face and then another person's face. We have to eliminate that surface contact transmission. Respiratory fit testing is a really difficult situation right now, and I've seen a lot of misinformation out there. OSHA has not suspended fit testing requirements for body shops. They have suspended and issued guidance for not enforcing routine fit testing for healthcare workers, uh, which is a very different environment than collision repair. However, there are a lot of vendors that have started to basically no longer offer fit testing because they're not sending people out into the field. So you as a shop, if you have someone that is willing to do fit testing that's a third party, they should be disinfecting the nebulizers and hoods after every use. And we do not want to perform sensitivity tests with the hood on. For those of you that don't know, a sensitivity test is to determine whether or not the person can notice or sense or detect the solution that that person is going to use during the fit test. We do not want them to have the hood on with no respirator and they're just breathing into the hood and potentially transmitting the virus to that surface. So we don't put the hood on until the person is actually wearing a respirator and the fit test administrator should be wearing PPE as well. I am hearing from OSHA's national office, their resources are tied up and focused on other areas. We are not seeing anywhere near the traffic of OSHA inspections that we typically do. However, I wanted to make sure you were at least aware that OSHA did not suspend this fit testing requirement, but I'm also not seeing it enforced in light of the coronavirus pandemic. I've also gotten a lot of questions about, well, how do I know I'm creating a safe work environment and how do I communicate to my employees that it's okay for them to be here versus when they need to do something different? And what we call that is we call those exposure levels. And depending on the exposure level and depending on how they feel, there's going to be different actions that they need to take. So the first is what we call community spread or no exposure. That means we know it's here. COVID-19 is everywhere in the United States now. Um, we know it's out there in the community. But your employee doesn't have any knowledge of anyone that has been they've been in contact with directly or indirectly that was diagnosed with COVID-19. So under that circumstance, if they feel well, they can stay at work. But they need to follow the exposure precautions and they need to be going through all the things that we talked about today. Now, if they don't feel well, but they don't have COVID-19 symptoms, which again are fever, cough, and shortness of breath, if they don't have those symptoms, they should still stay home and self-monitor. They should give themselves a couple of days to see if those symptoms come up or if they feel better. If they do feel better and they do not have those symptoms, they can come back to work. However, if COVID-19 symptoms develop, or when they begin to not feel well, they immediately have cough, fever, or shortness of breath. They need to seek medical attention and not come to your shop. However, it is very, very important that they call before just going to the hospital or going to the doctor or urgent care clinic. The medical community is inundated and overwhelmed with the amount of cases and people that are coming to their facilities. There are tremendous doctors and nurses that are capable of providing telemedicine, doing this over the phone or FaceTime, and giving the recommendations or what they need to do. And in most instances, symptomatic for COVID-19 means you're just going to stay home and monitor your symptoms. Now, if you develop shortness of breath, you're instructed to go to the hospital or go to the doctor immediately. But in most cases, anyone that becomes symptomatic is being told to stay home anyway. So we don't want people just to run to the hospital to get tested or to see a doctor, especially with that area being completely inundated with people that also think or do have COVID-19. The next level is indirect exposure. Indirect exposure would be you have an employee, they have been in contact with an individual 
that was in contact with someone else that was diagnosed with COVID-19. This would be you have a body technician and their spouse has a coworker and that coworker has COVID-19. Um, if they feel well and they've had indirect exposure, they can stay at work, but they need to continue to follow the exposure precautions. Now, if they were instructed by a doctor to self-quarantine, even if they feel completely well and they have no symptoms, they need to follow the doctor's instructions and stay home for whatever period of time they've been told to self-quarantine. The thing to remember, we have really good data coming out of a study in Iceland looking at general populations and who develops symptoms. And they're finding that 50% of carriers of COVID-19 never develop symptoms. So just if a doctor says you need to quarantine because of indirect exposure, they need to stay home even if they feel well or they don't have symptoms. Now, if they've had indirect exposure and they don't feel well or they become symptomatic for COVID-19, they need to seek medical attention and they need to not come to the shop. Again, call first before going in due to the amount of cases that doctors are handling so we are not overwhelming them or potentially exposing that employee to even more COVID-19 carriers. Third level is direct exposure. This is if your painter has been in contact with someone that was diagnosed. Let's say they have a spouse, a loved one, a neighbor that they're still interacting with and they got diagnosed, now they've had direct exposure automatically they need to stay home and contact their healthcare provider for instructions, even if they feel well, even if they have no symptoms. Remember the incubation period, which is how many days it takes for someone to start to exhibit symptoms upon first exposure to the virus is up to 14 days. It's why when you look at the orders, it's why when you look at the CDC guidelines, everything is focused on that 14 day window. So if they have had direct exposure, even if they're not symptomatic, they need to stay home, follow their healthcare instructions guidelines because you don't want them at your shop potentially transmitting that virus to your customers, your vendors, or your employees who may immediately become symptomatic. Stay home, don't be a hero, take the precaution and see how things develop. The last level is a confirmed diagnosis. If they have been diagnosed with COVID-19, Obviously, they're not at your shop. They may be at home. They may be at a hospital. But once they've gotten their diagnosis, they need to notify you or their supervisor, as well as anyone else that they've been in contact with in the last 14 days, because now that person that they were in contact with has had some level of direct exposure. Infected employees must stay home, follow the doctor's self-quarantine instructions to not further the spread of the virus. Be aware that today is a deadline for every shop in the country. All shops must post the new paid sick and family medical leave rules that are taking effect today. And all shops are now required to provide up to two weeks of paid sick leave for COVID-19 related reasons. This could be due to a quarantine order. This could be due to a doctor's instructions to stay home and self-quarantine. It might be because they've been diagnosed or they have symptoms. It also might be because they're taking care of someone that has COVID-19 in their home. But now there is that sick leave window that must be provided, uh, and that starts today and goes through the end of 2020. Now, free posters, if you have not done this, are available for downloading and printing on the Department of Labor website. The picture on the screen gives you an example of what that poster looks like. But please be aware, there are poster companies out there that are already telling shops you have to spend $100 to buy a new poster or your existing federal minimum wage poster is no longer valid. That is not true. You do not need to spend money on this. You can download and print and hang it up in your break room and be compliant with this poster requirement that starts today. There are some OSHA considerations to be aware of. There is what's known as the general duty clause for shops. And the general duty clause says that you as the employer 
are required to provide employees with a workplace free of recognized hazards, and COVID-19 is absolutely a recognized hazard, that can cause or likely to cause death or serious physical harm. Illnesses are considered a part of serious physical harm. Employees also under OSHA regulations can refuse to work when there is a reasonable belief that there is risk of imminent death or serious injury. And there are whistleblower protections in place that result in significant penalties for retaliating against an employee for exercising their rights or complaining to OSHA about workplace safety. Now, for those of you that are on this call or listening to this webinar, I presume that you are conscientious employers, that you are trying to do everything in your power to create a safe working environment, and you're looking to implement best practices. I just want to make sure you're aware that there are cases out there where shops are disregarding COVID-19 related considerations, employees are very concerned about their health and safety, and they are turning to OSHA for consequences and support. One of the things that I think is really important is making sure that your employees are trained properly. I talked about it earlier that there is an absolute bombardment of information that is going to customers, but also your employees from social media and their family and news sites. And you're going to get, whenever you're dealing with people, you're going to get a wide variety of responses to that level of information. Some people are going to have high levels of anxiety and stress and feel overwhelmed and be borderline panicked about COVID-19. Other people in your shop go the other way at the opposite end of the spectrum and feel like this is all a hoax and you don't have to take it seriously. Your responsibility as the employer or manager is to ensure you provide the training on COVID-19, its symptoms, its illness prevention strategies, and what you're doing at your shop to ensure that when they're in your building, they take it seriously and they adhere to social distancing. Now, we've seen ourselves as a true partner to the collision repair industry by protecting your businesses, employees, and communities. We absolutely see this mission as more important than ever in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. So if you need resources, if you need training, um, we have made it available for free to the entire industry. Send an email to COVID-19 at gmgenvirosafe.com with your shop name, your address, and your phone number, and our task force will set you up with bilingual English and Spanish COVID-19 employee training the learning management system, all of our shop-specific management bulletins on the topics, webinars. We've also pulled in resources for companies that specialize in employment law, sick leave, FMLA, and general environmental health and safety content. So send an email there if you need help, and we will get you free access to all of this, and we'll be updating it as we have new material, new webinars, new content, or new information to post. Thank you for your time. Melissa, did we get any questions? We don't have any. Does anybody have any questions for Brandon? I will follow up with everybody who's on this webinar uh, with his contact information so you can um, communicate with him directly if you do have a question. Um, again, don't forget that uh, website, but I'll, I'll put that in the follow-up email as well. Um, just getting a lot of thank you for the information. Very informative. Um, we really appreciate everybody's time today. Um, so I, with that, I don't think we have questions. Uh, again, thanks, everybody. We appreciate your time, and uh, be safe. And we'll be in touch with the follow-up uh, information for Brandon and a link to this webinar. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>